All right, welcome back to respiratory number five. We're looking at emphysema, which is an abnormal permanent enlargement and destruction of, of the alveolar walls. Now remember the alveoli is where all the action is happening, where um, oxygen and CO2 are being exchanged. Because the destruction, and it is permanent, of the lung tissue is happening at this level, the air is getting trapped in the lungs, the CO2 trapping um, and causing it to be, um, causing the lungs to hold on to the waste. And remember that with emphysema, we have the elasticity, it's gone. Um, so the carbon dioxide gets trapped in there, causing the um, hyper, hyper uh, reflection of the chest there and the patients aren't able to expel that excess gas that's trapped in there. Um, over time, this can lead to pulmonary hypertension. It also can lead to right-sided heart failure, um, core pulmonal, so, um, which we all know from our, um, from our history with um, AMP one and two, that that can lead to left-sided heart failure. So we're looking at, you know, a lung disorder that can have a negative impact not only on the lungs but also the heart and the rest of the body. So um, when we have a patient who has um, been short of breath with doing the minimal of um, exercises like just walking or using the stairs and they present to their their um, physician's office complaining of these of these side effects of shortness of breath from just doing a little bit of walking, then what the physician will do is inquire further and ask them questions like, have they, um, do they have a feeling of tightness in their chest? Um, do you have a productive cough when this happens? So are you, are you able to cough up mucus when this happens? Um, are you, do you have wheezing when this occurs? Um, the physician will go on to ask the patient if they smoke. It is the number one cause of COPD um, smoking is with like 80-85% of the cases is due to smoking. So, um, um, but there's of course 15% that are caused by other, other issues. Um, there is also a genetic um, deficiency. So there's an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Not many cases of emphysema is caused by this, but it is a genetic predisposition to getting emphysema. Um, so again, we need, we need to be aware of it. So um, the two primary causes of COPD, again, are cigarette smoking, which is about 85% of the cases, and then the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Um, but then again, then again, it could be anything from um, pollution to um, the job you worked. If you worked in the coal mines where you in, inhaled all those, the dust and all of the um, contamination. If you um, built homes and were exposed to um, fumes from painting, from the building, from the um, installation of the uh, padding that goes in the walls, sometimes people are inhaling those so it's there's a lot of things that can lead to the destruction of the alveoli um, that can all, that can cause emphysema to occur later in life right so these patients may may not have smoked year, for years and years or they may not have worked in the field that's causing this um, this lung disease to occur but it does um, have a permanent affect and it is seen later in life permanent effect and is seen later in life. Um, and we'll do a chest x-ray, take a full history of the patient, as well as look at their um, ABGs to see how well they're able to maintain um, oxygenation. And their treatment is going to be for life, right? Because once they get this um, condition, it's permanent, right? And it is uh, long-term for the rest of their life. And We'll do uh, chest physiotherapy um, help with um, ventilation. So that includes giving them um, uh, bronchodilators, uh, corticosteroids to help with the inflammation um, and exacerbations of the condition. Um, so they're going to be given albuterol 
um, and or atrovent. That's the bronchodilators. Then, of course, corticosteroids such as Pulmacort. Um, and then when they have an exacerbation of their condition, then we'll put them on an antibiotic that will help fight off the current infection that is causing the exacerbation. Um, so if they have a bacterial infection, that is, we'll put them on an antibiotic. Um, we're going to push for low flow O2. Remember, we don't want to um, encourage them to go above five liters on the oxygen because this can knock out their drive to breathe. So we're going to encourage them to stay four liters or uh, below. So um, that can help them. And they need to be educated as to why this happens. The CO2 will build up in their system and will cause them um, to uh, cause the brain not to remember to breathe, literally. So they're, while they're starving for oxygen and it's on their mind all the time, if they turn up the CO2 above five liters. This will cause them to retain more CO2, which will in fact cause them to breathe differently, which will trap more and more CO2 and it will go up and it's just a vicious cycle. So again, they we don't want to knock out their drive to breathe. So we're going to encourage four liters or below. Um, so looking at the mnemonics in front of you, COPD, has uh, patients are definitely easily fatigued. They do get frequent respiratory infections, right? Um, they use their accessory muscles to breathe. Um, uh, they have poor pulmonal, of course that's later in like the end stages of the disease itself. They are thin in appearance. Remember it takes energy and to eat right and so we want to make sure that we're encouraging them to eat more fat more protein more calories because they're not going they're going to get tired after about three or four bites and stop eating we are going to encourage per slip breathing this will um, help expel that co2 um, they have a prolonged expiratory time um, they are short of breath they have a barrel chest um, they have a chronic cough, and it is um, digital clubbing due to the lack of oxygenation. Emphysema specific is um, they are carbon dioxide retentions. They don't have cyanosis. Um, they will not have a productive cough. It will be what we call an ineffective cough, like a dry cough. Um, they speak in very short jerky sentences because it's exhausting to speak they get very anxious they can't get enough oxygenation in their mind um, they're using their accessory muscles to breathe um, and we are going to keep a real close eye on them because we know the heart's going to be impacted by this disease process as well right so you and i breathe simply to release carbon dioxide rather than the need for oxygen um, our brains do it naturally. We don't have to think about it, right? Emphysema patients are not the same. They retain carbon dioxide. And again, they're starving for oxygen. It's on their minds all the time. So because they are CO2 retainers and starving for oxygen, that is their drive to breathe, right? We, If we turn up the O2 above, five liters, then they're going to be retaining more CO2, which is going to knock out their drive to breathe. So we cannot, um, we cannot, you know, we got to encourage them to, to do four liters or less. Now, does that mean if they get sick and end up in the hospital, we won't go above five liters? Absolutely not. They end up with pneumonia and we have to go above five liters while they're in the hospital. We'll do that while they're in the hospital. We just look to go back down to what they were on prior to this incident um, and this is exacerbation. So that's what we're going to encourage them to do. Now looking at chronic bronchitis, this is patients who have been, um, who've got exposed to chronic bronchitis and it has had it twice or more in less, um, like two really extended periods of chronic bronchitis, then they'll be diagnosed with actual COPD chronic bronchitis. Um, Again, smoking is the number one cause. And in this case, mucus is getting trapped in the airways, causing inflammation to occur. And 
um, causes the narrowing of the bronchial tubes. Um, and it is also diagnosed on a chest x-ray. And if the patient's already having heart-related problems, like um, core pulmonal, then that can be detected if they do an echo of the heart. Um, we're going to we're going to see an increase in the red blood cells and H and H as the body compensates to produce more oxygen for the body. Um, the patient's going to be cyanotic, so they're going to be dusky color. Um, they are going to have a productive cough with the mass sputum, lots and lots of sputum. They're going to be hypoxic, acidotic, respiratory acidosis. They're going to be edematous. Of course, they're going to have an increased respiration rate. Um, they're going to be short of breath, especially during exertion. Um, digital clubbing is very common. Their heart's going to be bigger. Remember, the heart's a muscle, and it's working extra double time, so it's definitely going to be enlarged. They're going to be using their accessory muscles to breathe. We want to push fluids with these patients because they have those copious secretions. So we want to thin them out. So we're definitely going to push water, push the patient to drink water. Adequate hydration will help them be able to expel those secretions if they drink water. Water. Put them on bronchodilators, corticosteroids, mucolytics, and antibiotics for their exacerbations. And then finally, asthma. Asthma is episodic, so it happens where you have exacerbations and the patient will have times where they're completely fine. When they have an episode, though, of an asthma attack, this is when they'll have narrowing of the airways. It'll start with the patient wheezing. They'll be tachypnic, tachycardic. They'll have chest tightness. They may have a productive cough. You will literally see their, their nasals flaring and they'll be very, very anxious. That's because they um, aren't able to breathe, right? So they're very, very anxious. Uh, anything can cause an asthma to trigger an asthma attack. Extrinsic factors may include what's blooming in the air. Um, it may be um, someone's perfume, or it could be an intrinsic factor, an underlying infection that they don't even know they have, right? Like a respiratory infection. It could also be stress, like nursing school, haha. <laughs> um, or it could be physical factors too. So um, we want to look at whether or not they have a family history of, of asthma, um, and then make sure that they're aware that um, they're going to be retaining CO2. They're going to have a prolonged expiratory. Um, they're going to have increase in mucus, shortness of breath. They're going to have an expiratory wheeze. They're going to be tachycardic, restlessness, tachypnic. You might be able to see retractions when they're having an asthma attack. Usually we see um, people get asthma early in their years, like age 12. There's a higher occurrence in males, um, but it can happen to anybody, and it can happen later in life. You can have asthma when you're younger and outgrow it, or you cannot have it when you're young but get it when you're elderly. Um, it is an emergency, though, if it's status asthmaticus. That means it's a life-threatening situation. and um, if you have an asthma attack, if a patient has an asthma attack and the medications, the bronchodilators aren't working to treat them, then they should seek immediate medical help. It is a, a medical emergency for them. Um, so again, we're going to treat with a uh, bronchodilator like albuterol and then once you get through the asthma attack then we're going to put them on a steroid corticosteroid to help keep down those asthma attacks um, so that's called the maintenance steroid therapy that's the um, flow vent um, and then of course they'll have their um, atrovent uh, for a maintenance bronchodilator and then of course their albuterol for a rescue inhaler if they need it also steroids we could give them steroids as well um, okay this is it and then we'll do one more thank you